Welcome back. We're going to continue uh, with our lectures about the Italian Renaissance, moving for forward in time to the 1500s or the 16th century, or if you want to be all fancy Italiano about it, the Cinquecento. And uh, we're going to be beginning with a period we call the High Renaissance. No, this is not the name of a Cheech and Chong film, but rather this is a period, a, a very short period, really incorporating just the first two decades or so of the 16th century, where the Renaissance, for lack of a better term, reaches its height, its, its height in terms of the sort of fame and influence and importance of the artist and its height uh, in what some would argue um, in the execution of uh, sort of these great works and the creation of some of the most famous works, uh, not just, I think, from Renaissance or even from Euro European history, but maybe some of the most influential and known works in history. Uh, this is the time where we sort of reach the superstar artist. And you can just sort of take a, a quick gander here at the list on the left of the, the names. We have Leonardo da Vinci, and we have Raphael, and we have Michelangelo, and beyond the uh, sort of usual suspects of the Ninja Turtles, we also have the great artist Bramante, along with the Venetian masters Bellini, Giorgione, and Titian, and the Venetian architect Palladio. So these are kind of the superstars. And this is, you know, the sort of dream of the Renaissance artist, isn't it? To reach this kind of immortal fame. This is something we talked about in the last chapter, as fame being a sign of one's moral character. The um, it is proof that uh, you know you are, are willing to put in the hard work and put in the effort to become great, and that uh, that greatness uh, or that um, that makes you a moral person too, because you are not squandering this beautiful divine gift of uh, of being a human being that was given to you by God. That's sort of the whole point of humanism, right? To be the best you can be, and the reward for that being the best you can be and putting in the hard work uh, and all the effort is fame. And in the High Renaissance, the fame that these artists reach is international in scope. We are looking at really some of the first international celebrities and the fame that they wanted to achieve was the kind of fame that rang through history. And this is what many of them achieved. I mean, just simply by saying Leonardo, you guys know what I'm talking about. And here we are 500 years after his death. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, the fame they achieved is rather impressive and it's worldwide. Um, but they wanted a, a kind of immortality uh, through fame. Um, but the High Renaissance is also um, um, denoted by several distinct characteristics. Uh, these artists aspire to beauty over strict adherence to realism. Uh, so one of the things we talked about in the early Renaissance, I think over and over and over again, is how nature is the model. Because it is God's universe, it is God's creation, and an artist's ultimate goal is to simply recreate that. Now, that that has probably got more... Um, you know, definitely play uh, in terms of verbiage than in execution sometimes, because we saw that definitely some artists, especially like Botticelli, didn't always adhere very closely to a natural model. Uh, but the, the lip service is that nature is the guide. But in the High Renaissance, these artists are just outright flouting that. They are saying, no, actually, I'm the model. My artistic vision is the most important thing. Uh, so we're going to see artists really kind of start to break away from um, this close adherence to uh, trying to depict nature in a, in a very close way. And instead, we're going to see artists really kind of push the boundaries uh, of what they can do. Um, also, we're going to see a shift from Florence as the center of the Renaissance to, to Rome. And th this is, there's several reasons for this politically and economically, uh, but what we're going to start seeing is a string of very powerful popes whose uh, one of their main purposes is going to be the restoration of Rome and bringing Rome back to its glory days. After several centuries of um, Rome sort of falling to the wayside, especially in the late Middle Ages, where uh, 
at one point we actually see there's two there's two conflicting popes and there's two centers of the Catholic Church and Rome is literally sort of crumbling in major areas and falling apart and these popes are going to come in and restore Rome to its former glory and in a sort of a vision of the Roman Empire. We're also going to see, like I said, these artists reach kind of a superstar status. And part of the reason for this is um, not only their own kind of self-promotion, but the sort of general view from, you know, enough people that they are great. In fact, we're going to see the first biography of, uh, of artist uh, being printed in this period by a guy named Giorgio Vasari, who himself was an artist, and the book is called The Lives of the Most Excellent Painter, Sculptors, and Architects. And it is going to do a lot to uh, sort of help um, embolden <laughs> these artists in, see, in, in promoting themselves even more and in sort of cementing their reputation as great men. So let's start with, without a doubt, the most, one of the most famous artists of all time, one of the most recognized names in not just the history of art, but in history, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, a guy born uh, near Florence in a little village called Vinci, uh, uh, born to a single mother, um, and whose father, although was not married to his mother, still supported him and saw this young man's genius and his ability as an artist and helped provide uh, financial support for him so he could study. He studied under the artist Verrocchio, who we have already talked about a little bit before. Verrocchio created a version of uh, the, the biblical David. Uh, we saw that sculpture in the last chapter. And this is one of uh, um, Leonardo's earliest teachers. He eventually um, started working as a young man for uh, Ludovico uh, Sforza, the Duke of Milan. It is at this point we, we start really getting, um, we can track Leonardo's career. We even have a copy of his very first um, job application, really. Uh, he's applying for a position for this Duke, not just as a court artist, but also as an engineer. In fact, in this, he lists all of the things that he can do. And most of the things that he lists are things like, I can engineer weapons. I can create, uh, you know, better fortifications for your fortresses and things like that. Because this Duke was, well, he was a condottiere, remember? He was this uh, warrior cast um, of... Uh, of people, and uh, this kind of stuff would have been really important to him, and Leonardo da Vinci, being a smart guy, um, sort of really touts his abilities as a military engineer. And at the end of this long list, very famously, uh, Leonardo says, uh, rather humbly and maybe even ironically, I, I can also paint and draw a little. Um, but he ends up working for some of the more powerful people uh, throughout Italy as a, as a young man. He works for a, a powerful family called the Borgias as an engineer. He eventually returns to Florence for a while, kind of ping-ponging from there and Milan, back from Florence and Milan throughout his career, living in Rome for a while where he works for a pope, Leo X. And then he uh, spends his later career, uh, last later career, working for Francois, not Francois, as it says. <laughs> uh, I'm so sorry for the misspelling. Uh, he serves under Francois the first king of France, uh, where he dies. Along the way, Leonardo created actually very few completed paintings. Uh, depending on who you ask, there's somewhere only around 12, 13 or so um, actual finished paintings. Um, he was a very meticulous painter. He was quite the perfectionist, and uh, he had very few paintings that he considered to be complete. Uh, however, there are some early works that have um, that we have records of that have been lost, but for the most part, Leonardo just didn't finish a lot of things. Uh, however, what he left behind tons of were drawings, and these drawings exist in the form of manuscripts. Very famously on the right is his image of Vitruvian Man. Uh, Vitruvian, that sh name should sound familiar to you guys because this is the same name as the Roman artist or architect and theoretician Vitruvius. Um, 
And from those, for those of you who took my Art History 1 course and you studied the Pantheon, you, uh, you've, you're familiar with his ideas of sacred, sacred geometry and the uh, image of the circle and the square where the circle represents the spheres, the heavenly realm, and, and the uh, square represents earth. And here we have Leonardo da Vinci's very famous image of Vitruvian man trying to show the sort of perfection of man because it's the humanist era and that's what we're going for, it, uh, being um, both kind of a um, perfect within the earthly realm, the square, and the heavenly realm, the sphere. Aha. Uh -huh. But uh, Leonardo da Vinci's, um, I, I think his work is um, also important to understand the mindset of the high renaissance and the high renaissance artist and we can see this in this rather early work called the madonna of the rocks and you can also see it in this early what is called a cartoon a sketch um, for another work of saint anne and the infant saint john um, but these are rather uh, similar images in their composition. So you'll notice probably immediately the use of a triangular composition. Uh, if you look here at the right of the Madonna of the Rocks, uh, Leonardo has arranged all the figures into a in triangular composition. Why has he done this? Well, simple answer is it looks good. It creates a very strong compositional arrangement. It brings your eye directly to the center of the canvas. Um, or in, in this case, the wood, I should say, uh, into the painting, and uh, it creates a sense of balance and harmony, all of those Renaissance things that uh, we, we are familiar with. And Leonardo, though, would arrange his figures in this composition a lot. Now, if you think about it, it's actually kind of weird. We don't all, you know, how, how often have you ever walked into a room with a group of people standing in the form of a triangle. It's completely unnatural. It's it's not something that um, you see a lot <laughs> of people standing in a shape of talking. And yet, Leonardo used it a lot. This is a perfect example of this concept of the high renaissance of the artist vision being more important than nature. And it is not natural to stand in the shape of a triangle, and yet Leonardo does it all the time, arranging his figures in this form because it looks good, it looks harmonious, and it is the artist vision that is most important, even more important than getting things to be natural looking. Because Leonardo understood something, I think, really important in art, that art is not life, right? Art is artificial. Art is artifice. Art is a pictorial vision of an, of an artist's idea. It is not simply uh, a replication of nature. And so if artistic licenses need to be taken, then so be it. You'll also notice in the background of Madonna of the Rocks this bizarre landscape. You know, this is a religious painting, right? This is um, uh, painted for a chapel at San Francisco Grande. This is in Milan, Italy. This is, um, uh, um, you know, a, a scene, a biblical scene. And yet, that is not a biblical landscape. Where is this place with these weird, craggling, alien-looking rocks? Well, nowhere. It's simply Leonardo's imagination. Once again, he's not trying to replicate things in a realistic way, but he's creating something that he finds artistically beautiful and intriguing. Um, we can see um, in this image... Um, the very famous Last Supper, and then also in the somewhat controversial restoration of the Last Supper, the use of the triangular compositions, not only in the center with Christ, but also if, with the three, or I should say four groups of apostles all gathered together in smaller triangles. Uh, he also uses linear perspective. Uh, very famously, you could trace all these lines, as we talked about, to find a vanishing point. Um, behind Christ, but he uses the the vanishing point as a way of highlighting Christ, as making him the focal point, literally the focal point of the composition. 
So once again, not a natural composition. In fact, the whole composition's sort of weird if you think about it, because he's lined everybody up on one side of the table in a way that, well, is completely weird. Nobody eats like this. You don't go to a dinner party at somebody's house and sit at one side of the table. But Leonardo doesn't care because it's not about getting it, making it real. It's about making it look good. That's the high renaissance. Also, Leonardo's experimenting with stuff here. He's experimenting with um, materials. This painting um, has been in bad shape almost, you know, since its creation because Leonardo was trying a, a technique called fresco, right? Fresco is painting with plaster. The plaster, um, the pigment is mixed in with the plaster and then it dries onto the wall, chemically bonding against the wall. And it's supposed, to, it's a very durable material. But Leonardo painted this um, using a weird technique involving tempera and plaster and painting on the, the, the plaster after it all, already dried, and it didn't work. It started to fall apart. And so uh, if we hadn't restored this thing um, oh, oh, multiple times over the years, it would probably be completely gone. And then, of course, here is Leonardo's most famous painting, and arguably the most famous painting in the history of art, uh, his Mona Lisa. Uh, this is an image of a woman named Lisa di Antonio Maria Gerardini, the wife of Francesco del Giocondo, uh, who is a, uh, a Italian merchant, a Florentine merchant. Uh, this is done in the sort of standard three-quarters view portrait. Uh, that has become popular during the Renaissance, and we see all of the hallmarks of Leonardo's style here. We see the triangular composition. I mean, La Mona Lisa is more or less a big pyramid. Uh, we see that crazy, weird, mystical fantasy sort of background in the uh, behind her, and then we see another aspect of his technique called sfumato. Sfumato, it literally means smoky. And you'll notice in Leonardo's painting, Paintings. We could see it in The Last Supper. We could also see it in his uh, Madonna of the Rocks. This weird, hazy smokiness, this sfumato that covers everything. Now, it doesn't look realistic unless, you know, you live next to a barbecue. The world is not going to look like this to you. And, but it doesn't matter. That's not what Leonardo's going for. He liked it because it looked sensual and beautiful and gave everything a soft edge and a warm glow. This is not about replicating reality, but instead expressing himself and his artistic vision. Um, the Mona Lisa is a very famous painting. I think that's an understatement, but it hasn't always been famous. I mean, it's, it's been famous in the sense that it was, it was a work by Leonardo da Vinci. Okay, sure. Um, it was a painting that he actually took with him to, um, when he, uh, at the end of his career, when he uh, became... Um, the court painter for the King of France, and he brought it with him there, and it's it has that's where it remained in France for centuries, um, becoming part of the king's collection. Uh, eventually, uh, being hung up in the Louvre Museum uh, for a while, it lived in Napoleon's bedroom, um, and it was a famous painting. But sort of among the sort of elite classes, it wasn't this sort of popular work that was known by everybody until in 1911 uh, when a guy named Vincenzo Perugia uh, stole it and he claims that he was an Italian nationalist and he's stealing it to bring it back to Italy and it should not be in France and he held on to it for two years until eventually he tried to sell it to somebody and they reported him for it and it was returned and it was upon its return that it achieved this superstar status. Uh, because when it was gone, it's, you know, it's like, um, you know, absence makes the heart grow fonder, right? Uh, and once it was gone, it was when people noticed it, right? <laughs> oh, irony. And people started missing this thing, and people wrote poems about it, and there were newspaper articles about it, and there was long treatises about how amazing it was. And also to add sort of to this scandal, there were some pretty high-profile people who initially were thought to have stolen it. In fact, for a while, the famous artist Pablo Picasso was a suspect and even interrogated by the police. And this all added to this sort of mystery and legend surrounding the Mona Lisa. So when it was returned, it was now the greatest painting of all time. The hype was, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
you know, off the levels and, and uh, people couldn't wait to see it again and restore this beautiful lost masterpiece by the great Leonardo da Vinci back into the Louvre. And now the Mona Lisa is, well, the Mona Lisa, right? It is the great painting of, of the Renaissance. But it was initially just a really nice portrait <laughs> of Lisa Gerardini uh, that Leonardo liked a lot enough to keep and take with him to France. My cat just bit me. That hurt. Ow. Um, Leonardo drew a lot. He drew a lot more than he painted. And he just didn't draw in preparation for his art, but he drew everything. He was an amateur engineer. He uh, drew architects, architecture that never was built. He studied human anatomy. In fact, uh, he was, it was illegal to dig up a body and to dissect a body at this time because it was considered desecration. However, the people, authorities turned a blind eye because Leonardo da Vinci was, well, Leonardo da Vinci, and he was allowed to dissect corpses and study anatomy. Um, in fact, on the right is the first anatomical drawing of a fetus in utero that he uh, drew from a corpse of a pregnant woman that he dissected. But he was constantly doing this because he was infinitely curious about how the world worked. Um, and he didn't just study anatomy. He studied engineering. He built um, early versions of helicopters, 400 years before helicopters were even a thing. He designed parachutes. He designed all sorts of different kinds of weapons and uh, things like that. Um, but if you read uh, his 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 books on painting, Leonardo will tell you that it is all to make himself a better painter. Because Leonardo believed to, to truly capture the world, uh, is, you, you had to know how it worked. So you can't paint a convincing cloud unless you know how droplets coalesce. You can't paint a convincing smile unless you know how the muscles in the face make that smile. And even though you know, he ultimately is, be, believes in the idea that art should be the pure expression of the artist, he's still a Renaissance dude, right? He still believes in this, that God is the model, that nature is the model. Now, you can tweak that model. You can do all sorts of crazy things to it. You can make it smoky, and you can make it, you know, uh, but you, 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 you gotta start with nature. While we're talking about drawing, I want to talk about a concept called disegno, which in Italian literally means drawing, but it has a deeper meaning in the Renaissance. It, well, you can see the definition here. It constitutes the intellectual component of the visual arts, which justifies their elevation from craft to fine art on a par with literature and music. Um, and the head of the Academy of St. Luke at the time said, drawing is the external manifestation of internal intellectual ideas. So in other words, the Zeno is more than simply drawing. It is the manifestation of an intellectual concept into a physical form. And it, this goes back to this whole idea, this whole concept that artists are special, that artists are able to manifest ideas into a physical form because they're given this divine gift. But it also means that art has to have a, a sort of higher purpose, that art is not simply a picture of something, but there is a moral obligation to art that it must make us better people, that it must inform us or it must... Um, inspire us, or it must intellectually challenge us, that uh, there is an edifying quality to art. There is a moral imperative inherent in the actions of the artist that means that art is more than something, something pretty to look at, but it is a manifestation of, um, of beauty, of intellectualism, of morality. And that's what disegno really means. And it is a concept that's going to, you know, it's already sort of been here in, uh, in Renaissance art, but it's going to really drive a lot of the art that we're going to be seeing from here on out, which uh, Soy strives to have sort of a higher purpose. So it means not only good design, good form, but moral 
a sort of a, a moral kernel at the heart of what the artist is producing. Raphael, our second Ninja Turtle. Raffaello Santi has, comes from a painting fa uh, family. His father was a painter. Um, he trained in Umbria under Perugino, whose work we've already seen. And if you look at this early image of the Marriage of the Virgin by Raphael, um, you, if, if you flip back in your book uh, to Perugino's uh, key, Christ Delivering the Keys to St. Peter, you, you'll notice the similarities, especially with the central planned building in the background, and look at those orthogonals uh, in that linear perspective connecting to that vanishing point. It's very regular, it's very precise. Um, Raphael's style, although he's influenced by Leonardo, and to be honest, very few people weren't who were working in Italy at this time, um, he loved the triangular composition. He took a lot of Leonardo's ideas, like many artists did. Um, but he has a very different style. He has a very clean, precise, elegant style instead of Leonardo's sort of warm, soft-edged, elegant, um, almost dreamlike kind of application of paint. Um, Raphael's colors are very crisp and rich and saturated, whereas Leonardo often has this sort of sepia toned amberish glow over cast over his images um uh, he moves uh, as a young man Raphael moves to Rome where um, uh, he spent a lot of his career uh, especially later on um, he saw the work of Bramante which blew him away I'm talking about Bramante in a minute but he learned from Leonardo he learned from Michelan Michelangelo um he ends up running a, a large workshop. In fact, Raphael, and, and this is a time of very famous artists, but Raphael in some ways is, is one of the most, if not the most famous, especially within Rome. The guy kind of lives like a rock star. He, he has the, you know, the adoration of the Vatican. He lives in, you know, a, a, in a, a, this lavish apartment supplied by the Vatican. Uh, he was... Uh, not only worked for the church, but he worked for some of the most powerful families of that time, and he was, without a doubt, a, a, a well-loved and uh, guy. And he was also very beautiful, very handsome dude, very talented, um, and he was quite the ladies' man. He never married. He was engaged to a woman, um, but he never married because they weren't really much of a match, and he died relatively young. He dies in his early 30s. Um, to give you an idea of, uh, you know, his fame is when he died, he was buried in the Pantheon, uh, the famous Roman temple, uh, alongside popes and kings and, you know, great men and women from the past. And here is an artist. And so this is like the, the dream of the early Renaissance, that artist would one day be celebrated uh, and, and interred in their death alongside the great rulers of, of history. And that came to pass in the High Renaissance. Um, and also, al along with that kind of fame comes infamy. Um, uh, Raphael, the, the very famous story is that in, during the last years of his, the last few weeks of his life, he was not feeling very well, and there's all sorts of theories about what he died of. It was heart related, probably. Um, but one of the famous stories, which may or may not be super true, was that uh, he and his longtime girlfriend, who was not the woman he was engaged to, uh, were involved in a sort of two-week lovemaking session, and he died of a heart attack. <laughs> so, you know, um, you know, live like a rock star, die like a rock star. But here's Raphael. Raphael was known for... Um, Lots of things, obviously, but uh, one of his famous, one of his most famous series of paintings are his Madonnas, his uh, images of the Virgin Mary. Now, Madonna means my lady. It is an, what we call an honorific title. And here is an image of the Virgin Mary with the Christ child and little baby John the Baptist kneeling before him. And you can always, uh, I mentioned this before, but the Virgin Mary is often depicted wearing red and blue, um, always blue, usually 
red and blue, or I should say often red and blue. Uh, if you look here immediately, you can see that triangular composition that he got from our buddy Leonardo, um, where the... Um, uh, what's her name? The Virgin Mary, <laughs> the Madonna, uh, and the and the children form this triangle. It also, in a in a Christian uh, context, refers to the Holy Trinity: the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Uh, this was painted um, upon his arrival when he comes to Florence for a while, uh, where he lived for a number of years. Uh, this was painted for a gift as to a patron, as a gift for a patron. Um, um, you can see that use, of, once again, of the pyramidal composition. Also, uh, that Renaissance chiaroscuro, that use of shading. And especially with Raphael, there's a real feeling of solidity, of form. Um, he was a master of this chiaroscuro, and that, that Madonna feels solid, doesn't she? She feels as if you are looking at a three-dimensional um, object. Uh, this is a work that he did for Pope Julius II. Pope Julius II, let's talk about this dude. Uh, Pope Julius II is an um, incredibly influential guy in um, Renaissance history. He is uh, a pope who named himself after Julius Caesar. So this is very much a humanist pope. A pope who doesn't name himself after a Christian saint or a Christian concept like Francis, right, or Clement or Pius. Instead, he names himself Julius II because he wants to be like the next Julius Caesar and he wants to bring Rome back to its former glory. He sees himself as Caesar or as Augustus and uh, he wants to create all these great building projects and he does. Um, he's a warrior pope so um, through warfare uh, and the spoils of war, he's able to finance uh, and these massive building projects, um, such as building a new St. Paul's Cathedral, or St. Peter's Cathedral, um, Basilica, I should say. I can't talk today, guys. Um, you know, building the, uh, remodeling the Sistine Chapel, yada, yada, yada. The list goes on and on and on. Um, but he wants to bring Rome to its former glory because before this, as I said, Rome had kind of fallen apart. It had fallen to the wayside. And, you know, there you read um, famous accounts of like cattle uh, grazing in the Roman Forum and it's just pathetic and sad and everything's crumbling. And Julius is like, nope, not on my watch. And he restores everything. What we are looking at here is one of a series of four large paintings painted by Raphael and his workshop um, uh, called the school. This one is particularly called, in particular, called Philosophy, uh, but we commonly call it the School of Athens. But this was uh, in the Stanza della Signatura, the Room of Signatures, a very uh, a room where where treaties and documents and things are signed within the Vatican. Um, and uh, this was one of four pain paintings uh, about the branches of human knowledge: theology, law, poetry, and philosophy. Uh, but this is arguably the most famous. Uh, it embodies the Renaissance love of classical Greek, Greece and Rome. In fact, we have an image of sort of the greatest hits of philosophy from ancient Greece and Rome. So none, these philosophers necessarily wouldn't have all lived at the same time because we're looking at a period spanning, you know, about seven or eight hundred years. But this is kind of like a who's who of all of the great philosophers set in a Roman setting. Well, actually set in Athens, a Greek setting. But it's really done painted more in sort of a Roman style with the use of these barrel vaults and arches and things. In the background, we see a painting of a statue of Apollo, um, the god of the arts, and, the paint, and a statue of the goddess Athena, the goddess of wisdom. So this is appropriate for the theme of school and philosophy, right? Art and wisdom. And then in the center, we see two of the big philosophers. We see Plato on the left um, and Aristotle. Plato, you'll notice, is pointing upwards because this refers to his Platonic philosophy. And we've talked about Neoplatonism a little already, um, but Pl Plato believed that there were these perfect forms, perfect concepts, perfect examples living in this sort of ether, living in this, uh, you know, outside of 
the world of the material. And so he's pointing upwards because his philosophy is very pie in the sky. But then we have Aristotle, who's um, um, very much an empiricist. He's um, a philosopher who believes in in, in, uh, observation and studying the world down here. And so you can see him motioning with his hands down towards the earth. And then you'll notice that the entire... um, Tableau here is split into halves, with many of the philosophers on the le- all the philosophers on the left being sort of Team Plato, and all of the philosophers on the right being Team Aristotle. And what's also fascinating is, um, you know, I'm not going to get into who all these are. Here's a list of these philosophers, and if you want to Google this and take a deep dive and explore who every one of these guys are, that is. Awesome. Uh, I, 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 you can have a lot of fun with this painting, but we don't have the time to do that here. But what I do want to point out is that for some of these characters, like for example, Plato, um, Raphael has given them the faces of contemporary Renaissance painters. So Plato has the face of Leonardo da Vinci. This artist down here, Heraclitus, has the face of Michelangelo. Um, Aristotle himself has put his face, I'm sorry, not Aristotle, uh, long day already. Um, Raphael has put his face uh, over here on this artist and maybe also this uh, philosopher too. Um, he's put a, a guy named Bramante uh, over here. But so, you know, what we are, th- what we are seeing is... Um, what? Why is he doing this? Because what he's trying to do is he's sort of equating these new Renaissance artists with the great minds. This is not subtle, um, nor is it modest. He's equating <laughs> these Renaissance artists and architects with the great minds of antiquity, with the classical past. And also what's important to understand is that here we are in the Vatican, in one of the most important rooms in the Vatican where decisions regarding the church are made and ratified, and there is not a single solitary Christian reference in this entire painting, humanism unbound, right? Um, it It is humanism with a capital H. Um, Now, that's not to say that the other three paintings in this series don't have Christian imagery. They absolutely do. But it's it's really important to understand the ubiquity of humanist thought. Uh, I mean, we have a pope who's calling himself Caesar, who's not using a Christian name, but using a pagan Roman name as his title. Um, Also, Fresco. Fresco is painting with plaster. Uh, and it is, it is applied using several layers of plaster with pigment mixed in, and it dries and adheres to the wall. This was a material that was used a lot in ancient Rome. So, of course, uh, Raphael is going to paint in this material. Here's a work by Raphael that he did for the Palace of Agostino Chigi, a very powerful Vatican banker. This is called Galatea. It is inspired by a poem from Greek mythology, and it tells the story of this woman who falls in love, this goddess who falls in love, and um, her jealous husband, the um, Cyclops um, Polyphemus, chases her and she eventually escapes. Uh, but it is this rather sort of romantic image of love and adventure, and that is uh, what Raphael is painting here. Notice his emphasis on sort of uh, the, the beauty and the sensuality of the human body here, uh, without, you know, not having to worry about the feelings of the audience of uh, the the church here, he's allowed to sort of express himself in a more playful, almost erotic sort of way. And uh, these kinds of images that were often painted for the homes and palaces uh, of these wealthy Italian um, families, um, uh, like we said before, in the early Renaissance allowed artists a lot more artistic freedom. And that is certainly uh, what we are seeing, in he- seeing here in Galatea. Uh, I can't leave Raphael without talking about his importance as a printmaker and talking about 
how uh, he made a lot of money and actually gained an international reputation through licensing his prints. Uh, actually, he didn't make most of his prints, his engravings, and you guys know what engravings are. It's uh, car uh, scratching an image into a metal plate. It's part of this process of printmaking we call the Intaglio family. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, he licensed these images out to an artist named Raimondi. And not only did this make Raphael quite a bit of money, but it also helped Raphael be recognized as an international artist because, uh, you know, these prints allowed people to see images that they normally couldn't see. If you wanted to see a work by Raphael, you had to go to Rome. Uh, but if you, thanks to printmaking technology now, if you want to see a Raphael, you just go to your local print shop and you can buy something like uh, the Judgment of Paris here on this image from Greek mythology. Raphael, um, as we as I talked about earlier, was very much a member of high society. He was a superstar artist, and he lived the good life. He was friends with the higher upper upper echelons of of the Vatican, as his the image on the left, this image of Pope Leo X, the successor to Julius II, shows that he you know was sort of in with the most powerful people of his day. The image on the right is a guy named uh, Baldessare Castiglione who wrote a book called The Book of the Courtier. The Book of the Courtier was sort of a guidebook for behavior of members of the court, uh, whether this is a member of a king's court or the, the court of the pope, the papal court, or court of a duke. But it was about how to behave in soci high society. It was sort of like you know a fashion blog or a men's gu grooming guide uh, about etiquette, about fashion, about culture, about how one should behave in the upper echelon society. You know, and it's things like, you know, dressing well, but not too flashy, wearing nice clothes, but wearing tasteful clothes, uh, wearing, you know, things made of nice materials, but not crazy. Uh, those kinds of things. Also knowing the latest, you know, knowing the latest news, uh, knowing uh, proper etiquette, um, knowing how to dance well, all of these sorts of things. Uh, they sort of laid the, lay, the groundwork for um, kind of proper men's, or not, really any in men and women, uh, behavior uh, within the courts. And here's an image of Castiglione, um, once again, uh, sort of resembling the kinds of things he'd be talking about in his book, a man who is, is well-groomed, who is well-dressed, who appears modest, but at the same time, um, there's a certain nobility and elegance about him. Michelangelo is our third great high Renaissance artist. He is an artist who grew up in a wealthy family, a, a noble family, and his parents, and especially his father, was actually disappointed and initially that his son wanted to be an artist, even though they humored him some as a child and allowed him to study art. His father hoped that his son would grow up to be a, um, you know, a government official like he was. But Michelangelo, the very famous story is that he was nursed by um, a nursemaid who was married to a uh, um, mason, and he grew up with a desire to be a working man, and this was considered to be below his station in society, but yet he's, he wanted to be this. He wanted to be an artist, and he eventually tells his dad uh, that he's, this is what he's going to do. He denies uh, and disobeys the wishes of his father, and he goes off to become an artist. Uh, luckily, he was supported by the Medici family, where he was taken in to, by the, this family, where he he was trained in their humanist academy, where he learned uh, about Greek and Roman humanism. He uh, studied the mythology and the philosophy of ancient Greece. He read the, you know, great orators of Roman, uh, from Roman history, and um, he, of course, studied art. The image on the right is an early work he did copying a German printmaker named Schongauer, who we saw this a few chapters back. And of course, uh, artists at this time uh, studied, um, learned by copying other artists, uh, established artists' work, of course. Um, Michelangelo eventually settles in Rome. Uh, where he carves his first major work, a work called the Pieta. He carves this for a French 
cardinal. Uh, Pieta means the, the pity, and it is uh, a scene depicting the Virgin Mary holding the, the, her dead son, Christ, in her lap. Um, this is an image that is not wasn't very common in Italy at the time, but more popular in Northern Europe. But since this French cardinal, you know, this guy from Northern Europe wanted it, um, Michelangelo carved it. Uh, it is uh, a very moving sculpture, and it's also a very odd sculpture if you look at it closely. Um, the Virgin Mary is shown as being rather large. She is twice the size of Christ. This is an artistic decision, of course, by Michelangelo, being the high renaissance. Artistic decisions are okay. Uh, if, he does, if he wants to break the rules of nature and make this woman more or less a giant, he can. So why would he do this? Well, first of all, it would look weird if we had tiny little, you know, five-foot Virgin Mary and, you know, a, a, a full-grown Christ in her lap. It would look almost comical, and that is not what he wants. It also portrays the idea of motherhood, of this, uh, you know, Mary, Mary Magdalene is, is larger than Christ because in her mind, Christ is still a, 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 her boy, her, her son, her child, and she cradles him more like an infant than a full-grown man. And that's, that's what Michelangelo is trying to convey here, this, this sense of, of love between a mother and her son. And look at the, the, the beauty with which he's carved. The, uh, you can see the close-up of the face of Christ here. There's an angelic quality uh, in his face. And also Mary, Mary, the Virgin Mary herself uh, looks considerably younger than she w biblically would have been. This is a woman who had been in her 50s, but yet she's portrayed as a, as a young, young woman here, uh, once again symbolizing her but not only her beauty, but also her divinity. Um, this is the only work that Michelangelo signed, and you can read the story down here, but basically it was out of sheer vanity. Um, he overheard two people arguing about who created this, and um, one person said that it was uh, from another artist, a guy named Gabo from Milan, and Michelangelo got really upset by this, and he snuck in to where this statue was, and he carved his name in the middle of the night, and he always regretted it uh, because he felt that it sort of ruined the, you know, it, it takes away from the, the peace. And it was out of sheer vanity, he said, that he did this. But in a way, this, uh, this sort of behavior is pretty indicative of Michelangelo's personality. He could often be very arrogant. He could be very self-centered. He could also be very brusque. He could be very irrational. And be, you know, he, he was the kind of guy who could be quick to anger or quick to act. Um, this is his work of the David. This was carved initially for the Florence Cathedral, but um, eventually placed in the Piazza della Signoria, the, the city hall, more or less, of Florence. And we've already talked about the importance of David in Florence as being kind of a mascot, representing the fortunes of the city um, in much of the same way that David, uh, the small boy David, defeated the giant and became the great king. Um, this was carved relatively early in Michelangelo's career. He was still an up-and-comer. He already had sculpted the Pietà, but was still a relatively young artist and new artist at this point. Um, he carved this into a stone that was thought to be impossible or at least extremely difficult to carve into, a stone called the Giant, which had already sat idle for 26 years after two other artists had tried to sculpt you using this marble and failed. And to keep in mind, this is a massive sculpture. This is 17 feet tall. This is like a two-story sculpture. So if a person were standing next to the David, they'd come up, you know, an average person's head would come up a little over the David's knee. It is, in many ways, a traditional humanist-style Greek sculpture, much like the image on the left. It is a young male nude standing in the contraposto position at the peak of his athletic and physical ability. Um, it is also similar to um, Donatello's David, as you can see in the upper left, in the same standing in the same position. But it differs in some key significant ways. First of all, this David is older. He is not a the traditional young boy of the Bible, but instead he is a grown man who's fully mature. Also, uh, where traditionally David is shown, uh, the story of David and Goliath is shown at the end of the battle with David standing victoriously over the head of Goliath. This is shown 
Stone gives us the moment before the battle. Because Michelangelo wants to address the concept of potential, which is one of the most renaissance of all and humanist of all concepts. This idea that we are all imbued with this potential for greatness by God. But it is not, the gift is not complete because it, we have to better ourselves. We have to become the best person people we can physically and mentally. And by improving ourselves in those ways, we improve ourselves morally because we have not squandered this gift. And so this is by showing us the moment before the battle. Uh, Michelangelo is addressing this potential we all have for greatness, but we have to be prepared. And notice how this is not a David of action, but a thinking man's David, a David who is as much of an intellect as he is an athlete, a David who is full of concentration and thoughtfulness, who is planning his attack against this giant, who is using his years and years of knowledge and training to reach this moment. That is the Renaissance ideal, right? That potential takes hard work to maximize and to execute and to um, turn into success. Uh, and so this is the most renaissance of all sculptures in many ways. It is about the potential we all have. Michelangelo was not a fan of painting, even though he trained as both a painter and a sculptor. He preferred sculpting. These are works um, the image of Moses and the image of the bound slaves are works from a, a, a sculpture he was doing for Pope Julius II. Julius II is an important figure in um, the history of uh, the Renaissance. He was a pope who named himself after Julius Caesar. This is a humanist Renaissance pope, a pope who equates himself more closely with the Roman emperors of old than he does with say, a Christian saint or a Christian concept like St. Francis or Saint, or the concept of like clemency, right? Um, he equates himself with a great Roman general. Uh, this was a pope who, when he took over Rome, Rome was in shambles. It was a city that was crumbling, and uh, he wanted to restore it to its former glory. And he did this by raising money through warfare, and then by filling the coffers of the Vatican with with the spoils of war. And he did. He he rebuilt the city uh, using the great, employing the greatest Renaissance architect of the age, to help build and paint the city into the. Well, this, the city it is today. And his greatest achievement was going to be his tomb, um, which was going to be a 70-foot tomb that Michelangelo would carve with over something like 40 figures depicting scenes from the Bible and figures from the Bible. And yet, Pope Julius II ran out of money and told Michelangelo he couldn't complete it. He eventually completed a sort of smaller, stripped-down version of it. As you can see, this image of Moses is from, but um, uh, Michelangelo was upset uh, because he, he, this was going to be his great artistic statement, and it was taken from him. Um, to, to make matters worse, oh, by the way, do you see the horns on Moses? Remember from a few chapters ago where we talked about the horn Mosai because of the mistranslation of the Bible? Anyway, um, this led uh, the Pope to tell Michelangelo that instead he would be painting a ceiling, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Michelangelo did not want to do this. Uh, he was uh, very upset by it. Uh, not only was his great masterpiece taken away from him, but now he had to do something he didn't want to do, which was, which was to paint. Um, but paint he did. Um, and it took him four years to paint over 300 figures covering 5,800 square feet, 70 feet above the floor of the Sistine Chapel, depicting nine episodes from the book of G uh, Genesis, along with numerous images of prophets and sibyls uh, and uh, various nude male figures called Inudi. Uh, and it was an incredibly difficult work to create. Um, it is the story of creation, the story from the beginning of the creation of the world to the great 
flood with the three central panels depicting the story of Adam and Eve and the creation of man. Michelangelo found this incredibly difficult. He painted this in fresco, painting on plaster. We've already talked about this before. A technique that's very difficult. A technique where the plaster dries incredibly fast. Um, basically, Michelangelo would make the full-size drawings on a piece of paper with little holes. And then he would take a piece of charcoal or powder and trace through those holes, leaving a stencil on the ceiling, and then very quickly with the plaster, paint inside those lines. This took over a period of four years, and he did not enjoy it. This is a, a, a page from Michelangelo, that, or a, a letter that Michelangelo wrote to a friend, Giovanni. Uh, says, I've already grown a goiter from this torture. I'm hunched up like a cat, my stomach squashed under my chin, my beard's pointing up in the air, my brain's crushed, my breast is twist like a harpy's, my brush is above me all the time, dripping paint on my face that makes it look like the f fine floor for droppings. My haunches are grinding into my guts, my ass hurts. <laughs> you know, he's just complaining and complaining. And on top of this, my thoughts, I'm going crazy, man. My head is filled with tripe. In other words, I, anyone shoots badly through a crooked blowpipe. In other words, uh, you know, I can't, how do you expect me to execute greatness if I am here in pain and going crazy. My painting is dead. Defend it for me, Giovanni. Protect my honor. I'm not in the right place. I'm not a painter. He saw himself as a sculptor, and yet what he created is one of the great works of the Renaissance, an image of, that glorifies the human body in a, in a way that maybe no work ever before had done it. Michelangelo loved the muscular male human body and very much in the sort of overall feel of uh, the sort of theme of the high renaissance which is the artist's vision is important above all else he gave everybody this strong muscular body Adam, God, the angels and he also plays with the idea of potential in this image, the creation of Adam, uh, one of the central pieces in the entire set of paintings where we see God and Adam. Before the moment, Adam is complete. He doesn't have a brain. He doesn't have a will. He doesn't have a soul. The thing that makes man more than just a beautiful creature, but makes man um, the, a, a, a being with the potential for greatness and he's showing us the moment before their fingers touch because that's what the renaissance is about the potential we all have for glory and greatness the strong muscular bodies are applied not just to men but to women once again this is michelangelo's prerogative as an artist here's a side-by-side -side comparison of, of the the, vat, uh, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel before it was restored in the 1980s and after it was restored. We will be having a class discussion about this, so I'm going to save this for later, but I did want to give you a side-by-side -side comparison. Who are the Sibyls? We already talked about Sibyls a bit. I think we saw them in um, uh, the Ghent altarpiece way back a few chapters back, uh, talking about um, these are like prophets, uh, women prophets from ancient Greece, and they are meant to prophesy the forecoming, um, uh, the fort foretold the coming of Christ, I should say. If we look here at this image of the fall of man, of the temptation of Adam and Eve by the serpent, and ultimately their expulsion, we can see uh, even Eve is portrayed almost in a strong masculine sort of way. You'll notice surrounding this image, and many of the images are images of young male nudes meant to, for, to serve no other purpose besides to glorify the human body, and especially this young ma muscular male body that Michelangelo thought was sort of the peak of physical Perf the, the peak of physical perfection. Moving on, let's look at some architecture of the High Renaissance. This is uh, the Nato d'Angelo 
uh, Bramante, and this is a, a small little temple uh, called the Tempietta, literally meaning little temple. This is um, in Rome. This was a temple designed to cover the grave of what was uh, traditionally seen to be the burial place of St. Peter. Um, this temple is in a small squarish courtyard, but originally this circular temple was um, meant to be in a circular courtyard that would have complemented the shape of the temple. This was made um, in, in what is called a central plan model, meaning that it stems from a central area and radiates outwards. This is based in classical Roman uh, temple architecture, most especially the very famous um, Pantheon, uh, which is also located in Rome. Um, this is, if you look at this, this is very different than early Renaissance architecture. Early Renaissance architecture, especially uh, that uh, made in the model espoused by Alberti, uh, emphasized flat facades, but this is just the opposite of that. We are seeing a, a strong interplay of light and shadow d deal of the, that is due to this three-dimensional layering of architectural elements, this circular colonnade, a row of columns, a colonnade uh, around the base, this balustrade, this, this railing, um, creates a sense of light and shadow uh, over the other parts, the rotunda here and, uh, and the, uh, the lower area uh, of the temple, creating a sense of drama. Um, you know, one of the things that we've kind of seen in general is sort of a moving away from this sort of perfect recreation of nature uh, in the High Renaissance and uh, more sort of experimental artistic expression coming to the fore, and that is certainly the case here. Bramante took this idea of the central plan building to a sort of uh, extrapolated it to a much more complex uh, kind of level uh, when he was asked by Julius II, who saw his Tempietto and loved it and wanted to use it to replace Old St. Peter's. Now, Old St. Peter's is a, is a, was a, the f main church of the popes and had been um, since the 4th century, but by this time it was old and decaying, and the Pope just wanted to completely tear it down and rebuild it, even though it was 1200, almost 1,200 years old. There were a lot of people against that, but the Pope being, well, Pope Julius II and one of the most... Um, you know, sort of hard-headed <laughs> popes in history uh, guided his way. And initially he had uh, Bramante design this rather complex central plan uh, work that is uh, a series of domes and nested smaller domes creating this complex interplay of nine smaller interlocking crosses. Uh, uh, in a very, very, I'm going to use the word complex again, this particular model was never built, but we do have examples of it, uh, f mostly because of uh, in these creations of these sort of commemorative medals that were sort of popular at the time to collect. Uh, would that show us the original plan, which was not only a series of domes, also very similar, uh, for those of you who took Art History 1, to the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, uh, but also the use of these four towers on the on the on the corners but this never actually got built uh, due mostly to Bramante's death Michelangelo was called in to complete this work and he did some simplification he took away the complex sort of nested domes and these interlocking crosses and created a much simpler more elegant plan um, but more or less kept um, uh, Bramante's uh, an overall sort of feel and design, especially with that central place dome, once again calling back to the, um, the Pantheon. Um, 
But uh, even though, Mich- though Michelangelo's dome was kept, ultimately, as we'll see in the next chapters, St. Peter's uh, the, did not take on the central plan layout. And this was due to members of the church who felt that it was just a little too pagan looking, that it needed to be a more traditional cross-shaped or cruciform-shaped church. So we will see that uh, instead, although some elements like Michelangelo's dome uh, will be uh, retained. Um, The next era we're going to be looking at is called Mannerism. We're getting a little head start. Mannerism is a sort of uh, natural continuation of the concepts of the High Renaissance, which basically said that um, the artist's vision is more important than anything else. And um, clinging and adhering to the sort of rules of nature aren't as important as self-expression. And you can see this in some of Michelangelo's later architecture, like his vestibule for uh, the Laurentian Library in Florence. Uh, This was um, made for a library built by the Medici uh, at the Church of San Lorenzo. And it is an odd... um, odd construction that sort of flies in the face of Alberti and his sort of concept of perfect rational forms. First of all, Michelangelo, if you look in the back, has created this mismatch or mismatch or mismatch of different pediments alternating between triangular and circular or semicircular. Uh, notice he has columns that serve no function. These, what we call an engaged column, a column that has been cut in half and embedded, that serves no function besides being purely decorative. This would have been, you know, not cool with Alberti at all. But the weirdest thing about this is the odd staircase, which alternates between um, rectangular stairs on either side and this odd sort of oval-shaped stairs that almost resemble sort of a tongue flopping out uh, in a rather inelegant, weird sort of way uh, that is in a way showing that Michelangelo is starting to kind of reject the traditional rules of Renaissance architecture, this sort of obsession with perfect form, and is having a little fun, is sort of playing um, with the forms a bit, and is pushing um, his artistic vision to the forefront. Very odd. It's a very odd-like building. Odd, odd building. Now we're going to move north, um, out of Flor- out of Rome, and out of Florence, and look at Venice. Venice, the great, one of the great trading capitals of Europe, um, a city that connected not just uh, to other parts of Europe, but throughout Asia um, and North Africa too, but is, is sort of the culmination of well, the, this series of routes known as the Silk Roads, made very famous to um, a lot of Europeans through the writings of Marco Polo a few centuries before uh, from a trading a Venetian trading family who travels all the way to China. But ultimately, Venice is a very wealthy city. It is a city of luxury. It is a city of imported goods. And that sort of luxurious lifestyle is reflected in the art of Venice. And so the art of Venice in some ways is very different than the art that we have seen in um other places of the Italian Renaissance. In fact, there's a term that we use to describe the art of Venice, and it is colorito. Colorito literally means color, but we also use it to describe more than just rich color. We use it to describe art that has a sensuality to it, that art is, is, that is meant to stimulate the senses. So by sensuality, I just don't mean sexual. I mean, uh, it, it's meant to stimulate uh, sensually. It's images of beautiful things evoke uh, you know, feelings of, of, of sensuality, of, of, of whether it's delicious looking foods or beautiful looking clothes or soft looking materials or shiny golden objects. Uh, there's a sensual quality, a colorito 
to Venetian art. And this is in direct opposition to the concept we talked about earlier, which is disegno, which is a sort of moral imperative in art, right? Which is art that is meant to be intellectually and morally stimulating. Whereas colorito is the opposite. Colorito is beautiful and luxurious and elegant, and it's not so concerned with kind of moral qualities as it is in beauty for beauty's sake. Now, that's not saying that Venetian art doesn't have any sort of moral message. That's not true at all. Um, but it has a very different focus in a, um, than a lot of the art uh, we, as we have seen in Florence and Rome. Bellini is one of the great artists of this period. We've actually seen a Bellini already. Uh, you can see it in the lower right. In a previous chapter, we saw his image of St. Francis. But here's an image uh, in his later style of the Madonna and Child with Saints. This is something called the Sacra Conversazione, a holy conversation, which was an image that was very popular at the time of a grouping of saints that were either from various time periods that were talking to each other or even addressing the viewer. But um, here we see um, them surrounding the Virgin Mary, the Madonna in her red and blue, which you guys should be able to recognize by now. But notice the beauty of the color here, the rich, deep reds, the, the beautiful blues. Um, and one of the reasons for this saturated deep color is because of the use of oil paints. This isn't painted in fresco or tempera, which is a, what a lot of the painting from the Italian Renaissance is painted with, but instead this is painted with oil paints, which was an influence from the Northern Renaissance in places like Flanders and Burgundy, right? So um, this is um, a very different style of art. So there's less of a focus on sort of um, line and drawing and more of a focus on color thanks to this oil paint. Um, this is a work by Giorgione. Giorgione is, was a student of Bellini. He died young, so unfortunately um, his career didn't um, extend far, you know, uh, for a long, long time. Uh, this is a work in that in many ways I think represents a lot of what Venetian art is about, and this concept of colorito. We have this, this image, uh, this is called a tempest, and we don't know what it's about, really. There's a lot of guesses, but we see a soldier and we see a woman nursing a child, and they're separated by a sort of a small stream. Notice, first of all, the composition's really weird, with both subject matters pushed far out to the side. So this isn't sort of the rules of composition we've seen in Rome and in Florence with a strong composition, often a triangular composition right in the middle. Uh, in fact, there's emptiness in the middle here, but instead the subjects are pushed off to the side. Also, what is this thing about? Um, we don't know. Uh, we do know that, that this was actually changed, that originally the man on the left was, uh, there was actually another bather there. Um, but what, what this reflects is a concept we called poesia, or, or the, the poetic. It's, the painting is, is less meant to be read sort of literally as having a sort of literal meaning or tell a, a literal narrative, but instead is meant to be more like poetry. It's meant to be more impressionistic. The meaning is meant to be more poetic. Um, so, you know, there's lots of interpretations. Maybe this is Eve nursing Cain. Uh, after the expulsion from the garden, uh, or uh, with God's anger and wrath shown in the background with the form, in the form of this tempest or this storm, or this is maybe a Greek mythological story of Demeter, um, once again with the anger of the gods being reflected in the background, or perhaps it's the Virgin and Christ, or Venus and Cupid, we don't know. There's lots of interpretations. Uh, but we do know that uh, Giorgione changed his mind and put in this male figure instead, which means that he didn't have a set meaning to begin with, because maybe in the end the meaning isn't, wasn't, wasn't important, but instead seeing this, the overall sort of beauty and elegance of this image is what was important, right? Colorito as opposed to disegno, right? This is another work that uh, is painted either by Giorgione or perhaps his student Titian or perhaps both together. There's a de debate. Um, 
but this is an image um, called Pastoral Symphony, a painting called Pastoral Symphony. Once again, oil on canvas. Um, and then look at those rich, rich colors. Uh, what's fascinating about this image is, once again, we're not, not exactly sure what it's about. Um, it portrays this pastoral scene. Sometimes the word Arcadian is used, A-R-C-A-D-I-A-N. Arcadia refers to an area of Greece that was untouched by war. And it has come st since to mean a sort of... Um, almost a Garden of Eden, a pastoral kind of landscape of, of a place of no care, is a place of peace, a place uh, where in some ways the arts are allowed to flourish. There are some who interpret this as an allegory for art. We have these two, mus or we have two musicians um, and we see a woman going to a well drawing water and this is often interpreted as the woman on the left is drawing water from the, drawing inspiration from the well of inspiration and that may be true. Um, but the, the ultimately, any sort of allegory or metaphor is kind of secondary here to this idea of just beauty. Uh, this, these beautiful women, these beautiful clothes worn by the men, the idea of this beautiful music being produced with this pastoral Arcadian image of a shepherd in the background and this beautiful, these trees being blown by this breeze. Uh, it, it is... This is colorito. It's sensual, it's sumptuous, it's elegant, it's pretty, and it doesn't really matter what it means. Uh, even when we see religious scenes, like in Titian's, Titian is the great artist. He was uh, Giorgione's student and sort of picked up the mantle after Giorgione died young, and very much there's a direct line between Bellini, Giorgione, and Titian. And Titian's work is... Um, takes this rich, deep oil color to sort of the extreme. He becomes the official painter of Venice after Bellini's death. That's how big this guy is. This is a work of the Assumption of the Virgin. This is um, a belief that the, the Virgin Mary at, at the end of her life was assumed bodily into heaven. Uh, and here we see her being taken into the arms of God, being lifted, all these sort of little cherubs taking her up into the heavens. But look at the way this is painted. Look at the, the first of all, the sort of the dramatic poses of the figures. Uh, emotion is taking center place over intellect here. This isn't, these aren't like the, the thoughtful, rational figures of David, for example, of Michelangelo's paintings. But instead, these are emotional, engaged, active figures. And then look at that rich, deep, red of the Virgin's um, garment that is mirrored in God's cloak and the cloak of and the garment of the figure down here at the bottom. Then look at this beautiful warm orangey yellow um, uh, opening into heaven, uh, this beckoning, welcoming, um, rich, orangey, amber, yellowy glow that is in caps engulfing the the top third of the painting it's rich and beautiful and sensual and vibrant and everything the venetian renaissance is about um, titian brought that sensuality not only to to re religious christian artworks but also as his his, his work here for a private uh, um, palace uh, an image uh, from uh, a poem by the Latin writer, Catull the Roman writer Catullus, the meeting of Bacchus and Ariadne. This comes from the, the ancient story of, of Theseus who abandons Ariadne, uh, even though she helped him out of the, the, the maze of the Minotaur by using her, her thread as a, as, a, as a guide to get them out of there. He dumps her because Theseus was kind of a jerk. And so here comes the god Bacchus, to rescue her. And once again, the even though this is a religious, or not, a, a mythological image, the focus isn't so much on the story, but literally on kind of a pageantry. It's almost set up like a parade, isn't it? These figures with Bacchus sort of leading them with this, I love he's riding this chariot that is pulled by leopards. There is an exotic 
sensual quality to this entire painting. Um, look at the deep, rich greens of the forest behind them, uh, compensated with that sort of beautiful magenta of Bacchus's cloak, and along uh, contrasting the blue cloak on the left of uh, Ariadne's garment. And what ultimately matters about this painting is not so much the story, but just the kind of beauty and pageantry of the image. And that can also be seen in Titian's Venus of Urbino, a work that is probably actually not really a Venus, uh, because we don't have the normal things to tell us this is Venus. There's no Cupid in here at her feet, but instead we get a little dog. So what is going on here? This is uh, made for a um, du the Duke of Urbino. Um, and we don't know exactly what for. Some scholars think that this was celebrating a, uh, his marriage and this was a, a wedding present, or some think that it celebrates uh, it's, it's a portrait of a courtesan. We don't know, um, but certainly this is a sensual image, an image that is not just sensual, but is overtly sexual, where we have this female figure lying on a bed, gazing into the eyes of the viewer in a very evocative, erotic sort of way, as she, to put it bluntly, touches herself in an erotic, enticing sort of way. Um, this whole image is... It's sort of the equivalent of a of a centerfold, right? Uh, uh, and not only is it, it it displays a kind of overt sexuality, it display displays a kind of sensual overload in terms of, well, the entire room behind her. This look at look at this beautiful silken. Um, bed um, bed sheets that she's laying upon. Look at this incredibly rich velvet curtain hanging behind her. And deeper into the room, we can see this, this incredible marble floor. We see these servants opening these caskets called Cassione, um, pulling out her, her clothes. And you can imagine these clothes are made from silk and velvets and the richest, finest materials. And then hanging on the walls are these gorgeous Arabic tapestries with this little cute purebred dog lying on the bed and this Venetian sunset or maybe sunrise uh, in the background. So this is, first of all, I, an encapsulation of, uh, I think, the, the high the height of Venetian society, rich and wealthy and just teeming with these um, incredibly expensive goods. This is how the other half lives, right? This is the 1% of, of Venice, right? Um, and yet, you know, this is still a Catholic country. So there is the idea that we are looking at, at somebody's wife, perhaps. Um, the, the dog, certainly, we've seen this symbol before, this idea of fidelity, of faithfulness, uh, ref reflecting the idea, perhaps, of a marriage. So making this rather erotic, evocative image still maybe a little all right to look at, <laughs> perhaps. Um, but certainly... Um, this kind of just open sexual display would not have been something that would have been common in Florence or Rome at this time, where everything had to have a sort of moral quality to it. But in Venice, if we want to look at, you know, a, a beautiful room with a beautiful li lady lying on the bed, then okay, that's fine. We can see that same sort of sumptuousness in paintings, for example, of Isabella d'Este, a very... Um, famous and powerful uh, um, uh, patron of the arts, um, who was the Marquess of Mantua and an avid collector of the arts. Uh, due to her position in society as a woman, she held no real power herself, but because she was um, married to a powerful man, she could exert her power. But a lot of women in, in Renaissance society, unfortunately, their power had to come through a man. But, you know, we often don't think of, of women as being major players in Renaissance society, and they absolutely were. But it was 
it was not necessarily on paper, right? Uh, women like Isabella de Este were certainly powerful women and probably a lot of huge influences on her. She was a huge influence on her husband and maybe some of the, even the political decisions that he made. And certainly uh, had a, a lot of power when it came to um, the sort of art that was collected and being a kind of a tastemaker at the at the time, but that's not necessarily something shown on paper, right? Because she didn't hold any sort of official power because it did come through the husband. Um, I want to look now at a movement called Mannerism. Mannerism is a style of painting that emerges after the High Renaissance, and it's a very odd style of painting because it takes this idea of sort of the artistic license to the extremes, and it completely removes itself from nature as being the model. In fact, one of the key terms of mannerism is the figura serpentinata, or the serpentine figure. We can see that here in this image of Madonna with the long neck, this image of the Madonna and child, where we see this weirdly elongated Christ child, this strange Virgin Mary with this tiny head and this sort of large body and this very long, weird neck. Um, this is not natural at all, of course, but the idea of mannerism is that that's not the point. Mannerism is meant to be, um, well, mannered. It is meant to be uh, something that is removed from reality, you know, and, it, and it, this kind of comes from like the affectations of the upper classes where they often spoke in a very mannered, weird, stylized sort of way where they carried themselves uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that differentiated themselves from the lower classes. In other words, this is about style over substance. This is about uh, elegance over realism. Um, this is pushing the artistic vision to its furthest uh, corners. Uh, like in this work, Venus, Cupid, Falling in Time, once again, if you look at the figures, they're odd. This figure here uh, of, of, of Cupid, uh, whose body seems disjointed and disconnected from itself. And also, the story here is, it makes no sense. It's a weird allegory where we have all these symbols of time and jealousy, and but they don't really quite add up because meaning, disegno, that moral imperative is not what's important. Sophonisma Angisola was a woman artist at a time where women artists were rare because women couldn't uh, study under master artists. In some cases, women couldn't become artists at all in some certain areas of Europe. Um, and so it is rare to find women artists, although there are a handful um, and, and Sophonisba was one of them. She uh, was a, a born a noblewoman, uh, and she was trained, as many noblewomen were, to be a musician, to be an artist, to be uh, an intellectual as a, as a way of, of being an entertainer, uh, as fulfilling her position in society as, as a young nobleman's wife. Um, but she fell in love with art, and she pursued it as a career. Um, she was so good. She was even recognized by Michelangelo, who said, yeah, she's good. Um, she eventually becomes the court painter for the Philip II of Spain. Uh, but this is a woman who succeeded in a man, man, man's society at a time that it was very rare. Even Vasari, who wrote the big book on all the great artists, uh, praised her talents. Um, so moving on. Um, let's look at a few final paintings here. Tintoretto and his Last Supper. Here we can see in the late Renaissance or in this Mannerist period, things are getting to be really extreme. Uh, we are seeing um, still those Renaissance things like um, linear perspective, but notice how the perspective, the, the focal point is off to the side. Notice how instead of the elegance of Leonardo's Last Supper, where the, sup the table is laid out in front of us in this big horizontal, instead we have this dynamic, dramatic, long table, um, sort of coming at us in this foreshortened way out of the picture plane. And also notice 
the the inc the incredible contrast this chiaroscuro that is incredibly dark in some areas and incredibly light in others notice how we're seeing more drama and more artistic license being taken. We can also see that in this work called Christ in the House of Levi, which uh, is by um, the artist Veronese. And this was originally supposed to be um, a, a, an image of the Last Supper, but it was turned into a scene called Christ in the House of Levi because um, Veronese filled this scene with um, the strange characters. He filled it with dogs and dwarfs and, oh my goodness, foreigners. And this was considered to be sort of sacrilegious. And he was even taken in front of the Inquisition and put on trial. And he's like, no, 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 I don't want to deal with this. Um, I, I'm going to change the name of it. And this is no longer a Last Supper. This is Christ in the House of Levi. And so that, that took some of the pressure off. So even though this is in terms of its layout, very traditional in a Renaissance sort of way, um, very similar to Leonardo's um, Last Supper. The, the content and the group of characters that he put in this were rather, rather strange. Um, so the mannerism is all about taking chances and pushing things even further. Um, last two works of architecture I want to look at is first Palladio, who was the great Venetian architect. Um, who based his this work here called the Villa Rotunda on, uh, you guessed it, the Pantheon. This was made for a retired priest, and it is, um, you know, made in the central plan style with a central rotunda uh, and then a porch on every corner, meaning to create a, a perfect view no matter where you sit. Uh, this is basically a retirement home for this priest. But this is um, a style of architecture that is often called Palladian uh, in that it emphasizes elegance um, and, you know, sort of Renaissance elegance and perfect forms. And finally, wrapping things up, um, uh, Giulio Romano's courtyard uh, facade of the Palazzo del Te in Mantua. And here we can see, I think, um, the... Uh, mannerism at, at its most, well, manneristic, right? We see, um, notice the pediments at top and how we have these Greek architectural features that appear to be falling, these little what are called metopes, that appear to be falling. Um, he's playing with the traditional forms. It's like he's taking the Greek classical tradition, which is the basis of the Renaissance, but he's tweaking it and messing around with it and having fun with it in the same way that Michelangelo did with his staircase that we saw earlier in the Laurentian Library. Um, so there is a playfulness to um, this style of man to mannerist art. Okay, so that wraps up the chapter, guys. I know this was a long one. I appreciate you guys sticking with it, and I'll see you next time. Bye.